30 News. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Russ Reisinger. Our top story tonight, a huge spike in COVID-19 cases across Montana. As state health officials confirm nearly 2,000 cases over just the last three days. Now, this is the most cases Montana has seen in at least 22 months. Gallatin County saw the biggest jump with almost 700 new cases, while Yellowstone County reported 159 new cases. The state also saw four new deaths. More than 2,900 Montanans have now died since the pandemic began. And those skyrocketing numbers are spreading into Montana schools. And as a result, one of the state's largest public school districts is returning to remote learning for at least this week. The Great Falls Public School System reported 185 individuals were out today with positive cases, the highest number of infections the district has seen. The substitute fill rate was below 46%, which means there were roughly 54 classrooms without substitutes across the district. And the Skyview boys basketball game scheduled for tonight at CMR has been postponed due to the staffing shortages in Great Falls Public Schools. According to the school district, 125 staff members were out due to COVID-related illnesses. As of now, there's no details on when the game may be rescheduled. Well, COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations continue to impact health care systems across our state, but some big changes this week are expected when it comes to testing, specifically at-home tests. Joe St. George breaks down what you'll soon have to do if you want to check if your family is infected or not. This week, more changes are expected in an effort to fight the pandemic. The biggest change, one involving those at-home tests, which, depending on where you live, can be difficult to find right now. Americans will start to get reimbursed. According to the White House COVID response team, this week is when insurance companies will be required to begin reimbursing you for buying those at-home tests in stores. The price of those have varied greatly recently, although usually they're between 14 to 25 bucks. The price has gone up nationwide over the last few days after various agreements with the federal government expired. So how will getting reimbursed work? Well, if a pharmacy or store doesn't work with your insurance company to make it free up front, it will likely mean you will still have to pay for it first on your own. To get reimbursed, you will likely have to go online and submit a claim. That process for some insurance companies takes 10 minutes to complete with the money coming back to you in 10 to 15 days, although that may vary and take longer. As far as getting that separate government website up and running so that you can request free at-home tests, major news is expected this week as well with the federal government finalizing agreements with the Postal Service to make sure they have enough staff to get those tests delivered. The public contracting period closed last week regarding this issue and some tests will start arriving at government facilities this week, which means deliveries will start soon. If you are wondering if the United States can keep up with this demand, according to health officials, production has been ramping up nationwide. In September, the United States was producing around 50 million tests per month. This month, 200 million tests are expected. In Washington, I'm Joe St. George. We all know that America is politically divided these days, but some Lockwood residents say that a line has been crossed in their community. These residents say that these flags and signs that are in the back are not just divisive, but are also vulgar. Very very vulgar. Tensions are high these days, especially when it comes to politics. But this woman, who wants us to refer to her simply as Linda, says things have gotten out of hand. There isn't logic ruling anymore. It's just unreal. These flags and signs have become a common sight along North Frontage Road in Lockwood. Being sold at this roadside stand, we've blurred the actual F word that's offending many. Just awkward. Yeah. Unnerving. But Linda says this isn't about politics. It wouldn't matter who the candidate was on these flags, Republican or Democrat. It's the word, she says, that crosses a line. I'm all for one having the right to speak. But if you can't make a statement without vulgarity, Perhaps the statement is best left unsaid. Especially when these signs are displayed in such a high traffic area for all to see. Kids are getting picked up at school. These 
signs are out there hanging around or the buses are there. I spoke with Sheriff Linder of the Billings Sheriff Department. He says that though the profanity lace signs may be offensive, he says in congruence with the First Amendment, there's not much law enforcement can do. We tried to speak with the man who's been selling these signs and flags. He didn't want to talk to us, but did acknowledge that there have been many who are offended and says he is ignoring them, which means there's little that residents like Linda can do, except try and ignore them as well. Everything has just gone so crazy. In Lockwood, Alina Howder, MTN News. It has been nearly three weeks now since a Sydney, Montana woman went missing and there are still no signs of her. 26 year old Caitlin Berry hasn't been seen since December 21st. Police found her phone, wallet and coat inside her home. Barry's the daughter of Grand Forks County, North Dakota Assistant State Attorney Carmel Madison. Her family's offering a $10,000 reward in the case. Multiple agencies have been assisting local law enforcement with the investigation, including the FBI and Border Patrol. Anyone with information is asked to call the Richland County Sheriff's Office. That number is 406-433-2919. And take a look at this. An oil well exploded today and caught fire in Granora, North Dakota. That's just east of the Montana border. Witnesses say they heard and felt the blast several miles away. Fortunately, no one was hurt. There were about 1,300 barrels of oil in the tank that exploded. And at this point, they're just letting the fire burn out, which could take a well. It's not known what caused the explosion. As wildfire season has suddenly become a more year-round event across the state of Montana, the state's wildland firefighters are now getting a pay raise. Governor Greg Gianforte's office announced today seasonal wildland firefighters will get a raise of $1.70 per hour, making the base pay now $15.50 for seasonal firefighters. The governor's office stated that the raise is intended to recruit and retain qualified personnel. Seasonal firefighters with the State Department of Natural Resources and Conservation are often dispatched to a variety of wildfires across the state and help do other public land maintenance during their off time. Helena Unit Fire Management Officer Chris Splythoff said the raise will help make it worthwhile for the seasonal workers to make their way up the ladder to leadership positions. Hopefully we can get, uh, if we don't have everybody returning, you know, that, that changes year to year too. Sometimes we have a, a big turnover year, sometimes we don't, but this is definitely going to help a lot more people look. Um, yeah. It's a little more incentive for some that have been around a little while to, uh, you know, see this large increase. I mean, um, it'll be good. Yeah. No, we're excited and I, I look forward to seeing the applicant pool this year just to see, you know, just to see if we see a, a huge jump. Uh, you know, I kind of think we will. They're, they're on the streets now if people are looking. A typical season for a wildland firefighter stretches from Memorial Day to Labor Day. But Montana saw wildfire in every month of last year in 2021. In Billings, Mitch Laggy, MTN News. Well, farming and ranching can be a challenging industry, even when everything goes right. So when a pandemic, climate change, and inflation strike at the same time, you can only imagine the stress of those tasks with putting food on the table. That stress can lead to devastating outcomes for farmers and ranchers. According to the CDC, farmers and ranchers are among the most likely to die by suicide compared with other occupations. And suicide rates overall have increased by 40% in less than two decades. MTN's Megan Mannering introduces us to the people and resources aimed at ending the crisis. Dick Tyler was a farmer in Big Sandy, Montana, who lived and worked on his family farm since he was 12. Polished and perfected, teenager Gus Turner knows this story like the back of his hand. After 60 years of farming, he began to think of himself as a burden and useless to the farm's operation. His only solution in his mind was to drown himself in the farm's reservoir. He's recited it at competitions across the region for both FFA and 4-H. With a handful of accolades, it's clear he's done his research on the story of Dick Tyler and why Dick Tyler's story is an important one. So my topic was about suicide in farmers, especially in uh, rural areas in Montana. Um, it's a super undisclosed topic and people don't really talk about it and it's an unfortunate reality that we live in that nobody talks about this because it's a huge part 
of American livelihood is agriculture. In learning about the life of Tyler, Turner stumbled into a world of research. The farmer is uh, three and a half times more likely to commit suicide than an average person. The research spiraled into a speech he uses to bring awareness to and destigmatize the topic of mental health among farmers and ranchers. Kind of something horrible and I mean it's kind of just buried underneath layers of um, uh, rugged individualists of farmers who I mean just aren't there emotionally and you just don't really see that so it's kind of hidden. Turner isn't the only Montanan racing to address this issue. In fact, there's an entire department shedding some light on the hardships of life in agriculture. It's been a tough year uh, for a lot of folks, you know, whether it's grasshoppers or drought uh, or, you know, just volatility of, of the industry in general. Um, you know, it hasn't been easy. This summer, the Montana Department of Ag secured a $500,000 grant from the USDA. The goal, not too different from Missoula teen Gus Turner. You know, really what we're hoping with this program is that we can both, you know, kind of promote um, that it's okay to talk about these things and that, you know, the producer is really the most important part of the operation um, and then connect those folks with the services. Um, that are, that are needed. Andy Fiesit says the program will function in three parts. One, providing vouchers to Montana farmers and ranchers for free confidential counseling services. Two, providing funding for mental health workshops and speakers. And finally, a campaign to destigmatize mental health services for farmers and ranchers. If we can start from a place where this is not as stigmatized as it has been and, and you know kind of help break down those barriers then hopefully we can help kind of tackle the issue in missoula megan mannering mtn news well still to come on the mtn 530 news here on q2 we'll hear from the author of a new book that chronicles some of the worst disasters to ever strike montana then a little later in sports the plays that made the difference we'll have this week's game changers the MTN 530 News continues right after this. From Montana's news leader, you're watching the MTN 530 News. A new book by a fourth generation Montanan takes a deep dive into some of the big sky country's darkest days. However, the author says the book is about much more than death and destruction. Here's MTN's Tim McGonagall. From the flood of 1964 to the Custer Creek train wreck outside of Miles City in 1938, Butch Larcombe's original articles for Montana Quarterly Magazine ignited a passion for his latest book, Montana Disasters. What really it turned out to me is that these are all interesting events in Montana history and ones that are worth remembering. And I thought by doing a book and doing some, trying to do good research around them that it would help people remember them. The book includes about 25 full accounts on disasters dating back to 1895, with references and short passages on others. Larkham says it wasn't easy to narrow it down, and it's not necessarily a list of the worst disasters. There's no yardstick that's used to measure a disaster. You know, a disaster is in the eye of the beholder. And, mm -hmm. um, but I looked for ones where there I thought there was an interesting human story around the event and tried to get in contact or at least recall the experiences of the people that were involved so put a human face on these stories. Larkham says some of the state's lesser known events are his favorite stories. A 1931 fire west of Shoto on the Rocky Mountain front killed five firefighters. In 1950, the Browning High boys basketball team was staying overnight in Eureka after a game. In the middle of that cold winter night, the hotel boiler blew up, setting the hotel on fire. Many of the team, member, team members were able to escape by jumping out of second-story windows into snowbanks, and they actually almost threw their coach through the uh, window to get him out because he wanted to stay and look for other players. But as it turned out, two of their teammates were lost in a fire and three other people died in that fire. And the book's subtitle is True Stories of Treasure State Tragedies and Triumphs. Larkham says the triumph comes in some of the personal stories of people moving on, as well as the changes brought about by some of the disasters in areas such as mine safety and wildland firefighting. There's a couple stories about mine disasters in the book, and I think the awareness and need for mine safety was improved dramatically after those events. Um, similarly, with some of the wildfire events, you know, wild, fighting wildfires in the early days was a pretty hazardous occupation, and people didn't have much training. And after 
people saw how dangerous it was. I, they, they slowly adopted better training and better standards for firefighters. Montana Disasters is available in many Treasure State bookstores and online. Larcom will be giving a presentation at the Montana Historical Society on January 13th, which will also be available on the Historical Society's YouTube channel. In Great Falls, Tim McGonigal, MTN News. Well, the weather is looking like it is staying warm. That's if the wind stays around. Meteorologist Ed McIntosh shares more in his seven-day forecast coming up.